Our next speaker is um, Peter Thomas, um, who lectures in the Department of Politics and History at Brunel University and is a member of the Brunel Social and Political Thought Research Group. He's the author of The Grumpian Moment and serves on the editorial board of Historical Materialism. His contribution today is called Toward the Modern Prince, Gramsci's Machiavellian Metaphor. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much to the, the organizers uh, of this conference. Um, the paper I'll give today is not a paper on uh, Machiavelli or a contribution to Machiavellian scholarship, uh, a field in which I'm both an, an amateur in the English sense and an amateur in the, in the French sense. Um, the paper I'll give uh, is rather a paper about uh, Gramsci's reading of Machiavelli and a particular aspect of it, namely the, the specific time and the way in which, at a decisive moment in the prison notebooks, Gramsci turns to Machiavelli uh, as a way of, in some senses, refounding uh, his, his project in the prison notebooks. So in early 1932, that is uh, around two years after um, Gramsci begins writing the prison notebooks, he writes uh, what will become some of the most famous lines from the prison notebooks in Notebook 8, Note 21. And I quote, The modern prince, the myth prince, cannot be a real person, a concrete individual. It can only be an organism, a social element in which the becoming concrete of a collective will partially recognized and affirmed in action, has already begun. This organism is already given by historical development. It is the political party, the modern form in which the partial collective wills that tend to become universal and total are gathered together. Now, it's on the basis of citations such as this that it has often been argued from the very early years of the reception of the prison notebooks until today that the metaphor of the modern prince should be understood merely as uh, effectively a type of code word, uh, a code word Gramsci used to hide his true intentions from prison censorship. And according to this reading, the modern prince would be a code word for a communist party, which is then variously conceived by different interpreters, either in continuation with a supposedly classical Leninist or democratic centralist conception of the party, or as some type of a Western Marxist alternative to that notion of party organization. Sometimes later on, particularly with some of the more recent attempted liberal appropriations of Gramsci, the modern prince has been deciphered in a more expansive sense as a type of generic description of the modern political party as such, which is taken to represent a distinctive synthesis of normative, motivational, and executive sources of a democratic ethos uh, that supposedly underwrites modern mass societies. Even more recently, and I think increasingly, uh, particularly in a general uh, atmosphere of, of radical political thought, it's been suggested that the modern prince in Gramsci should be understood as representing a paradigmatic embodiment of what Bobbio, I think, correctly identified as a particularly novel conception of political power that emerges in the 20th century, namely the notion of political power as self-foundational in a line of reflection that runs from Weber's theorization of charismatic domination through to what I think is effectively its formalization in the Schmittian notion of the self-referential decision. So effectively, in this reading, we have uh, a notion of Gramsci's modern prince uh, as a type of proletarian Kairos in, in the temporal uh, sense against which uh, Warren spoke yesterday. I think this reading is present in some of the interestingly, increasingly frequent references to the modern prince uh, and Gramsci in Negri's uh, work. This line of reception has been most coherently elaborated, I think, 
uh, in some of the readings of, of Kalevis and, and also others who have attempted uh, a type of Gramscian, Schmittian synthesis. Now, the prison notebooks obviously do contain many notes on the political party. Gramsci develops a novel tripartite theory of the fundamental elements required for the existence of a political party, a mass element, a principal cohesive element, and an intermediate element, which would articulate uh, the mass and cohesive elements. Gramsci distinguishes between different forms of centralism, between democratic and bureaucratic centralism in his polemic, not simply uh, against an emerging Stalinist orthodoxy, but also against Bordiga's programmatic conception of party organization. There's a whole series of other important elements uh, which Gramsci provides for a reflection on the sociology in the broadest sense of, of the modern political party. Now, such is the richness of these many reflections on the theme of political organization in the prison notebooks that there's a very great temptation to uh, attempt to synthesize Gramsci's disparate notes on the art and science of politics into some type of systematic presentation, which would supposedly be encapsulated in the figure of the modern prince conceived as a political party. I think this is precisely uh, what was done by Gramsci's first editors, uh, Platone and, and Togliatti, when they assembled a special volume out of some of Gramsci's writings on Machiavelli and politics in the first edition of the prison notebooks in the post-war period, the, the thematic um, edition, uh, which included a volume specifically dedicated to, to Machiavelli and, and politics. Their particular selection and organization of these notes then formed the basis um, for many other uh, translations and editions of Gramsci's thought uh, around the world, particularly in the English anthology selections from the prison notebooks, which I think has exerted an influence uh, a long way beyond the Anglophone world as a particular systematization of Gramsci's uh, thought. This uh, particular reading and its organization of the notes, and perhaps also the type of notes that it excluded from uh, inclusion in a volume on Machiavelli and politics in Gramsci's writing, uh, effectively established what I think are, are the coordinates for the reception uh, of Gramsci's work in the early years. They created an image of a type of political Gramsci, uh, alongside a whole series of, of other Gramsci's. So we have a Gramsci who would be a Machiavellian in politics, uh, a Crochian in philosophy, um, and, and possibly also affiliated to De Sanctis and others as a literary critic and, and so forth. The various Gramsci's, literary, historical, philosophical, and political. Gramsci himself um, seems sometimes to propose such a project of systematization um, particularly in some of his early uh, texts. In the summer of 1930, in Notebook 4, Note 10, he even plans what he calls, quote, a book which would derive from Marxist doctrines an ordered system of contemporary politics like the prince. The argument would be the political party in its relations with classes and the state not the party as a sociological category, but the party that seeks to found the state." End quote. However, then immediately in the very same note, Gramsci goes on to specify that the distinctive feature uh, that he sees in Machiavelli's book, The Prince, uh, and the feature which any modern attempt to, to rewrite or recreate that book must also embody is precisely the dramatic form of the prince. I quote again from the same note, it would thus be a case not of compiling an organic repertory of political maxims, but of writing a dramatic book in a certain sense, an historical drama in action in which the political maxims would be presented as individualized necessity and not as scientific principles. Elsewhere, then, in Notebook 13, Note 1, the specially dedicated um, notebook by Gramsci to, to Machiavelli and, and other themes, uh, written 
uh, most probably in May 1932, Gramsci will argue that the fundamental character of the prints is that it is not a systematic treatment but a living book in which political ideology and political science are fused in the dramatic form of myth. And this is retaking a, a note from Notebook 8, which he uh, had written earlier in 1932. Or then again, from the beginning of, of Notebook 13, he argues that Machiavelli did not have recourse to, quote, pedantic classifications of principles and criteria for a method of action. Instead, he represented this process in terms of the qualities, characteristics, duties and needs of a concrete person. So again and again, implicitly and explicitly, Gramsci, who we should remember was also a, a, a theatrical critic, uh, will emphasize that it is the dramatic form of Machiavelli's mode of presentation that most, most interests him. So a former drama criti critic and professional revolutionary emphasizing the dramatic form of the politician and also playwright uh, Machiavelli's uh, mode of writing and thinking. This, in fact, seems to Gramsci to have been one of Machiavelli's great innovations, uh, which to Gramsci, I would suggest, was of much greater importance than the identification of any notion of an autonomy of the political, which, in a certain specific sense, was Croce's reading of the historical theoretical significance of Machiavelli and a position that Gramsci ultimately, I think, implicitly re rejects in favor of a theory not of an autonomy of politics but of its translatability. Machiavelli, according to Gramsci, literally created the modern political manifesto in the dramatic conclusion to The Prince where The Prince called by Gramsci here a concrete fantasy, merges with the people whose dispersed and pulverized lives it is organized into a collective will. So Gramsci has here uh, an almost Menardian project in the sense of Borges' uh, famous narrative of, of Pierre Menard, not simply a, of translating or, or rewriting a predecessor's text, but of re-presenting it uh, in some form, of re-inhabiting its dynamic. Here, the modern prince does not become the prophet who has created his own people. Rather, the modern prince is the prophet that is created precisely by means of this dramatic enactment of the qualities, characteristics, duties, and needs of the people itself. Now, I would like to suggest that Gramsci's Machiavellian metaphor, a metaphor, I think, rather than a figure, of the modern prince needs to be understood in a similar sense, namely not as a systematic presentation uh, which we can find in any one particular note or which would be codified in a series of directly political or organizational maxims and proposals which could then be contained in one special notebook or, or re-edited for presentation to a wider public and would function effectively as a type of euphemism for the concept of the political party, presumably a concept on its own that would be uh, insufficient to offend even fascist prison censors. Rather, the modern prince in the prison notebooks should be understood as a dramatic development that unfolds throughout the discourse itself, as Gramsci argues referring to, to Machiavelli, throughout the prison notebooks. The modern prince is a metaphor which almost alchemically transforms the dispersed and pulverized lives of the subaltern social groups into a new principle and practice of socio-political organization. It's in the distance between these two suggested projects, that is, between the notion of a treatise of ordered doctrine and the unfolding dramatic development of the discourse itself, that I would suggest we can see the emergence of the metaphor of the modern prince as indicative of a fundamental change of terrain of the research project of the prison notebooks, or a moment of its refoundation. So in order to understand the terms and significance of this transformation, we need to turn to consider the role of Machiavelli's in Gramsci's overall project, 
and its relation to, to other central elements in it. Gramsci, of course, had a very long and old interest in Machiavelli, which goes back to at least his, his university years. While he's a functionary of the Comintern, traveling through Berlin in 1922, he encounters his old university professor, uh, Cosmo, who urges him to, to write the book on Machiavelli that Cosmo has long been awaiting from him. The context here is, of course, um, very important in the 1920s. Mussolini will soon, um, after this encounter, write his own prelude uh, to the prince. Uh, and in roughly the same period, a little later, so too will Lev Kamenev, uh, an editorial indiscretion, we could say, that was later used against him as evidence by the Stalinist prosecution in, at the, sh in the show trials. Before his imprisonment, Gramsci had taken a very keen interest in the debate that was then underway in Italy and Europe more broadly between various returns to Machiavelli, liberal and fascist in particular, with the various contributions of Mikhail's Mosca, Ercoli, and Croce himself. It's therefore, I think, particularly significant, given this background, that Machiavelli is in fact absent from the first work plans that Gramsci composes upon imprisonment, both in his early letters as he sketches out his first plans of work and in the, the list of, of topics um, for further elaboration uh, that he pens uh, in the first pages of his first notebook. When Machiavelli does appear in these early notebooks, so in the year 1929-1930, um, it is largely, although not always, um, but largely, I think, uh, as an historically important figure in early European modernity and particularly Italian state formation. Effectively, the figure of national unification valorized in the tradition from the Risorgimento onwards in, in Italian political thought, which I think in some ways has more of a relationship with the reading that Althusser will later make um, than we have yet explored. Steadily but surely, throughout these early notebooks, Gramsci begins to valorize Machiavelli's strictly theoretical importance. We have some tentative suggestions regarding his decisive role in a, a genealogy of the philosophy of praxis in notebooks four and five, written in 1930 and 31. And then by the time of the beginning of notebook eight in 1932, this interest appears to have solidified into a definite research project. Now, it's precisely in the same period, following a, a health crisis uh, and other uh, interferences, that Gramsci begins work um, also for theoretical reasons on what will become known as his special notebooks. There's the notebooks in which he'll transcribe, sometimes with significant emendations and revisions, notes that he had written previously in earlier notebooks. And also in these notebooks there will be some new, new notes on, on the relevant topics. Notebook 13 is entitled Notes on the Politics of Machiavelli, written from the second, around the middle of 1932 through to early 1934. This would seem the closest to a plan for a systematic book on political theory. But this reorganization of Gramsci's research very rapidly spilt over into a significant number of new notes on Machiavelli in other notebooks, in notebooks 14, 15, and 17 in particular. So schematizing this development um, somewhat violently, we could say that from Machiavelli's relatively marginal status in the earlier notebooks, He's, Machiavelli now seems, as the notebooks develop, to have become almost a type of ether that pervades all of, of Gramsci's notes. Arguably present, even when his name is not explicitly invoked, and sometimes in very unexpected ways. And thus we have some very curious exchanges between Gramsci and, and Sraffa regarding Machiavelli's possible relationship to the physiocrats uh, in the discussions of, of, of economic theory. So why then do we have this turn to Machiavelli which immediately begins to exceed its own boundaries? At least two reasons seem to me to be decisive. The first, a reason internal to the, the, the development of the text of the prison no notebooks project, 
and, as I've suggested, decisive for its refoundation in this period. And the other reason, one that's equally internal to Gramsci's text, but in the form of the political context that overdetermines the prison notebook's project in its development. Taken together, these reasons enable us to see that the modern prince, as Gramsci enigmatically develops this notion, is something more than simply uh, a type of figure or a form of political organization, however novel that might be, and is instead a proposal for a research project into a new type of theorization and practice of politics, or to phrase this in Leninist terms, a proposal for a politics of another type. So on the one hand, Gramsci turns to Machiavelli, I think, his preoccupation with Machiavelli increases at a precise moment when his previous organizing perspectives seem to have reached some type of an impasse uh, or indeed perhaps a, a falling into crisis. In the early phases of the prison notebooks, when Machiavelli, as I've suggested, plays uh, a predominantly historical rather than, strictly speaking, theoretical role in Gramsci's reflections, Gramsci had been particularly concerned to analyze the emergence of the forms of bourgeois political modernity. This line of research is encapsulated in his distinctive notion of passive revolution, a concept that undergoes at least three phases of expansion uh, in the early 1930s. So in the first moment from 1930 through to early 1932, Gramsci is developing the concept of passive uh, revolution in order to describe the formation of the modern Italian state uh, in the process of the Risorgimento, and particularly putting an emphasis upon the exclusion of the popular classes from autonomous and organized participation in the process of political modernization. Then in a second moment, which is partially contemporaneous with the first, um, but beginning perhaps a little bit later towards the end of 1930, Gramsci extends this concept in order to analyze other social formations, which seem to him to have gone through a similarly contradictory process of economic modernization without an accompanying political modernization. This is the moment in which Gramsci emphasizes the lack of a radical Jacobin moment, such as he comes to believe had accompanied the French Revolution, involved here in the process of Gramsci's reassessment uh, of Jacobinism. And then finally, in a third moment from 1932 onwards, it begins to seem to Gramsci, uh, it begins to seem as if Gramsci thought that the notion of passive revolution could have not simply an international, but perhaps also epochal meaning, almost as if political modernity itself has descended into passive revolution that would be conceived almost as a type of Weberian iron cage, the formation of a type of politics and a crisis of politics which could be managed but not resolved by various administrative deformations of political practice and the rise of totalitarianisms of various descriptions. However, then by early 1932, 1933 at the latest, Gramsci begins to argue uh, that the concept of passive revolution, as he'll write in, in April or May 1933, needs, quote, to be cleansed of every trace of fatalism. The concept of pa passive revolution, he goes on to argue, can have a concrete political sense, not if it is posited as a political program, but only if it assumes or postulates as necessary a vigorous antithesis, which autonomously and intransigently sets all its forces in motion. So at this point in time, the concept of passive revolution for Gramsci needs to be confronted and refuted um, by a potential for a process of, of depacification, if we want, by and within the action of the popular classes. The exploration of the metaphor of the modern prince, I would suggest, is both the form and the name of this new research project. Uh, a metaphor rather than a figure, as I've suggested, that dramatically captures the vibrant forms of this potential process. On the other hand, this very distinctive non-Pococcian Machiavellian moment in the prison notebooks, 
non-Pocockian because it's not concerned with durabilities of regimes, but rather with processes of the emergence of what we could call constituent power, coincides, perhaps not coincidentally, with the deepening of Gramsci's calls for a constituente of anti-fascist forces. This is a central term in Gramsci's later political reflections. It was not simply a type of reproposal of the calls for the Republican Assembly uh, from, the early, from the mid-1920s, or even the suggestion of the possibility of a type of uh, future um, post-fascist constituent assembly, as later, in fact, did occur in the pre-constitutional phase of what becomes the Italian Republic founded upon labor, or founded upon the corpse of the labor movement and the anti-fascist movement. Rather, what Gramsci was arguing for was a much deeper process of unification of the anti-fascist forces already within and against the fascist regime. It was effectively an argument for the reactivation of the politics of the United Front against the sectarian third period madness encapsulated in the accusation uh, that social democracy was merely the left wing of fascism. For Gramsci, it's founded, I think, upon an active memory of the decisive debates in which he had participated in Moscow in 1922 and 1923 uh, around the, the concept of the United Front. Uh, and it was precisely the implementation of these perspectives that had so strongly marked his own tenure as head of the Italian Communist Party before his imprisonment. What could be the forms of such a constituent process of political struggle? I would argue that the project of the special notebooks that Gramsci undertakes from 1932 onwards, effectively through to 1935, when his energies begin um, to, to, to run out uh, in terms of, of continuing work on his writing projects, that this project of the special notebooks was designed in part as an attempt to conduct a rigorous reconnaissance of the intertwining of the national and the international terrains that had been recommended by Lenin in those debates in the early 1920s. My, my thesis is thus that Gramsci's concept of the modern prince, his Machiavellian metaphor, is contained not only in the notes that explicitly cite Machiavelli or in which he discusses the political party or forms of political organization. Rather, the metaphor of the modern prince is also implicitly developed in the roughly 17 notebooks, that is the majority out of the 29 prison notebooks, if not the majority of pages, that Gramsci compiles from 1932 onwards including notebooks of both revised texts and some of his new notes. Notebooks 12 through to 29, if not also the decisive so-called philosophical notebook 11, are, I would suggest, the true attempt at the creation of a concrete fantasy or a representation of the modern prince in action. I make this suggestion because the, the nature of these later notebooks have often struck even the most attentive readers of Gramsci as signs in some ways of his exhaustion, um, as if they had elevated Gramsci's normal, necessary incompletions into a type of structuring principle. It does indeed sometimes seem that these special notebooks are not speaking of political organization at all in some cases, but rather are dedicated to other themes, so-called cultural, socio-economic or historical in the various notes and notebooks on, on themes, uh, themes around notions of culture, of the Risorgimento, Catholic action, popular literature, uh, journalism, Fordism, and so forth. We need to constantly recall, however, that these were notebooks written by a professional revolutionary who, until the end of his imprisonment, fully expected to one day be re rejoining the leadership of the international communist movement and thus uh, he was continually engaged in prison in a project of sketching out concrete political programs. Taken together, I would suggest that all of these special notebooks constitute a type of articulated cognitive map of the many different terrains that Gramsci saw on which the modern prince would be active. Out of the diversity and richness of the themes in these notebooks, Gramsci slowly composed a sketch or a series of sketches of the forms of popular practice and organization 
that might be capable of defeating the passive revolution of bourgeois political modernity itself. What results in the development of this Machiavellian metaphor is, I think, a novel dialectical theory of political organization as simultaneously, on the one hand, a civilizational dynamic and process of hegemonic politics, and on the other, the formation of an alternative proletarian hegemonic apparatus and organizational form. Gramsci's modern prints, unlike at least some readings of its Machiavellian ancestor, does not emerge from a void in order to impose unity upon it in a process of transcendental ordering. Rather, it is an historical and even civilizational epochal process of the emergence of increasingly articulated forms of self-governance throughout the social formations of modernity, conceived in their unity and distinction. The dramatic discourse that Gramsci develops culminates in some of his explicit notes on the party in the proposal uh, for a party form of a new type. It would be a party form subtracted from constitutionalism and therefore should not be conceived as limited to the party form in traditional terms, that is namely as a form of effective statal organization. Because this particular party form Gramsci proposes is one which must constitutively overflow itself in order to maintain itself. This is to say that the modern prince conceived in those notes Gramsci writes explicitly on the party represents only the tip of the iceberg of a much broader process of collective political activation of the popular classes throughout the society in all of the instances of deliberation and decision making. For this reason, the metaphor of the modern prince cannot be reduced to a type of figure of political formalism, of the type which has effectively, I think, dominated political modernity from Hobbes to Rousseau and beyond, in which a given political form arrives effectively from outside, to use the Kautskyan motto, in order to dominate what is then interpolated as its subaltern social content. Rather, insofar as the modern prince culminates in what I would suggest is a type of laboratory party form, it is a form that is merely the expression of a content which constitutively exceeds it. I quote from the notebook 13, note 1, from, uh, from mid-1932, the modern prince, as it develops, revolutionizes the whole system of intellectual and moral relations. The prince takes the place of the divinity or the categorical imperative and becomes the basis for a modern laicism and for a complete laicization of all aspects of life and of all customary relationships. The institutional consolidation of this process in a party form of a new type should thus not be understood as the formation of, to use a very fashionable phrase, a political subject conceived as a unified center of intention and initiative, or even as a type of instrument or machine, to use the, the terms popularized by Weber in particular. In other words, the modern prince is not some type of communist leviathan or a type of Marxist general will. It is not one of those figures from this tradition of modern state theory in which unity and stability come to dominate over difference and conflict, which can then only appear as un- or even pre-political, as the social chaos that statal politics must organize. Rather, the modern prince is an always provisional condensation of relations of force that continuously modify its composition as a collective organism and as an expansive revolutionary process. No unity closed within itself, Gramsci conceives the modern prince instead much more in the terms of a terrain, or even, as I'd quoted, as a categorical imperative, or again in another very pregnant uh, metaphor, as Gramsci says, the organizer of, of a popular national collective will and simultaneously the active and effective expression of that same popular national collective will. <clears throat>
The modern prints thus as political party, as the collective organism that merges with its people, thus represents the simultaneous point of departure and effective summation of the process of the immense concentration of hegemony that Gramsci had indicated as the goal of an offensive war of position against the logic of the passive revolution. It represents an active organizational synthesis of different levels and instances of the struggles of the subaltern social groups in Gramsci's very creative formulation, which should not be reduced simply to the proletariat or to the working class, but instead should be taken as signifying all of those excluded from the current distribution of power, the sufferers of injustice and the oppressed in Lenin's similarly expansive terminology or what Ranciere has more recently called the part of no part. The modern prince was a proposal for the political recomposition of the decimated Italian working classes and subaltern social groups within and by means of what we could refer to, if we use the vocabulary of the early Italian workerist tradition, as a type of compositional party, which integrates the moments of the mass party as representative or expressive of the class alongside a vanguardist emphasis upon leadership as the necessary result of and potential solution to the unevenness and contradictoriness of the capitalist stratification of the subaltern social groups. As an institutional embodiment of the specificity of hegemony as what uh, Badaloni, I think, very uh, productively called a method of political work, the modern prince represents a capacity of universalization of particular struggles and interests in a constituent process of the politically overdetermined recomposition of the subaltern classes. Thus, we have the modern prince effectively functioning uh, in terms that Marx had theorized after 1848 as the revolution in permanence, that is, the foundation for an autonomous and continuous working class politics. Notions continually recalled by Gramsci as the original formulation of hegemonic politics. Or finally, in other terms, to use those from Marx's later reflections on the Paris Commune, the modern prince would be the type of expansive political form or non-form finally found in which to work out the emancipation of the subaltern social groups. Thus, we have a process of totalizing expansion, the historical emergence of self-governance, productive conflictuality, and political recomposition. Gramsci's final recommendations for the forging of a new united front in his own time in, in the depths of the 1930s. Now, if I can be allowed to end this quite philological and perhaps scholastic uh, presentation with some political conclusions, I would suggest that this Machiavellian metaphor, and particularly the method of its dramatic development, could potentially be redeployed today as a type of prefigurative vocabulary for understanding and contributing to the movements of our own times. The uprisings and particularly open revolutions of the last years, as problematic as some aspects of them surely are, have nevertheless posed a fundamental, I think, both Machiavellian and Gramscian question. Namely, how would it be possible to coordinate the diversity of interests of our pluralized, pulverized, and dispersed peoples into a hegemonic force capable not simply of resisting the current order, but of initiating a constituent process and a construction of a socialist order in the forms of struggle already underway. One of the ways of searching for an answer to this theoretical and practical challenge, I would suggest, may be to experiment with Gramsci's Machiavellian technique of the dramatic enactment of the qualities, characteristics, duties and needs of the peoples themselves, in which prince and peoples, form and content, knowing and feeling, merge into no form or decision except that of their own collective totalizing expansion. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Peter, for this very enlightening uh, contribution. We have five minutes for questions, which means we'll take uh, two questions at the same time and then give uh, Peter a chance to uh, uh, respond. Um, Etienne and uh, Warren. Okay, so let's be very quick. Um, thank you, Peter. This is beautiful. I'm not opposed to this kind of uh, imaginative uh, reconstruction uh, of Gramsci's uh, intentions, program, and thought, much less. I think this is exactly what we need. I concur with you in the present situation. And the fact that you do it along, to put it quickly, post-operaista uh, uh, lines is also not something that I object to. It's an interesting reversal of a previous judgment on Gramsci that is taking place now in this uh, move, movement, more or less. But it's part of the conversation. I want to ask you two philological questions. There are two words, at least, very important in Gramsci that you had to either, don't take this as a, as a, as a, as a violent uh, opposition, uh, you had either to bracket entirely or to symptomatically leave aside. First of them is Jacob, you, you mentioned Jacobinism. But the Jacobin dimension is completely uh, uh, ruled out, if I well understand. And therefore, the notion of the national popular will is carefully avoided by you in your reconstruction, it seems to me. And the second is, um, I hope you hear this as praise, not as, <laughs> and the second as interest. The second is you used all possible terms, metaphor, figure, dramatic, uh, um, embodiment, concrete fantasy, never the one that Gramsci uses in the very text from which you uh, uh, take your departure, that is myth, the one that has a Sorelian uh, uh, background and which also, of course, would account for a comparison with the fascist uh, 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 use of the same uh, uh, legacy. So it seems to me that these two uh, uh, aspects are uh, uh, not to be incorporated in your reconstruction. I don't know if you uh, agree with that. Uh, very, a, a very similar kind of question, but with a different philological focus. Um, I too, like Etienne, I welcome the uh, resurgence of interest in, Machiav uh, sorry, in uh, Gramsci on the part of people who were quite dismissive at one time. But I want to come back to, I mean, I, I don't think we, we can forget the particular appropriation of Gramsci in the 1970s, which was not simply an, an imaginative projection onto his text of things that weren't there, but, a, but rather a kind of selection of certain elements with the exclusion of others. And in particular, the, the concepts of hegemony and as you uh, said at the very end of your exposition, the war of position in counterposition to the war of maneuver, these had a very particular set of political effects, in a, again, in a different conjuncture. But it, it made me think that what's, what's missing, from, I mean, there's a whole dimension of Machiavelli that I haven't read all the notebooks about Machiavelli, I don't know. But it, from what I know, what's missing from Gramsci's account of Machiavelli is precisely the element, however we want to phrase it in, in the modern sense, of fortuna and occasione. And, and I think without those dimensions, the notions of hegemony and war of position are going to repeat the problems that existed in earlier uh, historical moments. Thank you. Very quickly, um, I do agree with uh, almost uh, everything you said. Only I uh, think uh, there are things uh, could be uh, which could be added to your presentation. Uh, and uh, one uh, one thing in particular, one one detail, if you want, in particular, the, the fact that, uh, uh, as Gramsci says, uh, the prince is a party which uh, is ga is going to uh, uh, create, to found a state. No, that's to say, the prince uh, moves uh, itself between uh, the private sphere and the public one. 
uh, going from the private to the, to the public, just like in the Machiavellian uh, uh, the prince. No? That, that's to say a privato which becomes a prince. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the reference, Gramsci's reference to, to Machiavelli is, um, uh, has to be understood uh, in the light of this common uh, uh, position uh, in a time of crisis uh, is necessary to, uh, to create a new order, no? a new order to found a state. Huh? That's, that, that's why I think uh, Gramsci uh, reads uh, 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 the prince uh, instead of uh, the discourses, for, uh, for example, because the prince is, is a treatise for a time of crisis, no? Okay, uh, the, there is a text, I think, I don't remember, unfortunately, I think uh, it's in the notebook five, uh, maybe you can help me, uh, uh, where Gramsci says that the modern prince is just like, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the, the, party, the party is just like uh, uh, a, a, a king, which uh, 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 doesn't, uh, which is uh, uh, reigns, no, regna, but doesn't govern. No, it's not a, an element of the gov government, and is referring to the to the unique party, to the totalitary party. Let's say it, uh, in in two different uh, regimes. Italy and the uh, Soviet Union. So uh, this, could, uh, th this is the question. Could, could it be the origin, the prehistory of the modern prince in the sense that the modern prince cannot be seen all, um, uh, only as a, a, as a party, no? but as a party in that time, in that time of crisis where there are uh, um, post-liberal regimes where the, the difference between private sphere and public sphere is, uh, is going to to, to become uh, uh, um, not clear, no? Uh, is moving. Okay. Um, thank you, three. Um, a, a number of questions, um, not all of which I, I can answer or do justice to. Um, firstly, I think it's very important Gramsci's reassessment of, of the Jacobins from his pre-prison writings and throughout the prison notebooks, and it's very true that the concept of, of will uh, is quite decisive in this context, and my exclusion of that is, is quite deliberate. Um, it's, a, it's a debate I've had often uh, with, with Peter Hallwood, and we've been um, going on with some friendly and not-so-friendly exchanges for a number of years on this theme. I think the great difficulty is reconstructing the sense of will in, in Gramsci and its development throughout the prison notebooks which in my reading, uh, which uh, I admit is, is an interested one, I think can't be reduced to any of the various uh, psychological figures of, of intentionality and so forth. At a deeper level, the way Gramsci conceives of a national popular collective will seems to me to correspond much more strongly to a concept of relations of force with the formation of a collective will then set in some ways... Um, opposed to a certain Rousseauian um, tradition of thinking will in terms of, of unity. But that's a whole research project, I think, to try and explore and tease out um, these potential, as it were, theoretical anti-humanist dimensions in Gramsci's work. And that um, also involves doing a certain amount of violence, possibly, to his text itself um, in order to, to valorize, valorize those elements. I think that's the project, another project to, to undertake. Um, the, the, the question of myth is, is also um, very decisive because Gramsci develops quite a clear critique of Sorel around the notion of, of myth um, and effectively transforms this term. He uses it very infrequently and it will disappear from his discourse. He'll mention the myth prince and it disappears from his discourse once he's uh, he's criticized, I think, precisely to escape those dimensions he saw in Sorel, which is why his preferred term becomes the notion of a, of a concrete fantasy. Um, but these are certainly elements to, um, to, to develop further in, in terms of the general reassessment of, of Gramsci that's, that's now underway in, in, in different countries. Um, the, around the question of um, the appropriation of, of Gramsci, I agree with Warren very strongly that rethinking Gramsci in relation to Machiavellian themes of Fortuna and Occasione is, is, is decisive. Um, I don't think it's so much a question of um, 
of needing to add to those elements to Gramsci's work, but perhaps in some ways of attempting the types of symptomatic readings that would discover that they're already present and functioning. It's very true that Gramsci's thought was appropriated for different ends in, in different periods, but of course that's neither here nor there in the sense that any particular author um, has been, can be uh, appropriated for, for those, those different ends. I think one of the decisive elements to think through um, is to think Gramsci in the line between Machiavelli and Spinoza in some ways, which is an area in which much work has not been done in attempting to conceive of Gramsci, um, if we want, uh, as, as a, a, a theoretical anti-humanist, um, but also as, as a theorist of, of certain forms of, of what I would call, in a way, heretically a type of constituent power running through Gramsci's conception uh, of, of organization. Um, and finally, on, on Fabio's uh, question regarding the foundation of a state, that's very true. The emphasis is, is decisive for Gramsci on this particular type of political party that wants to found a state. But the question then becomes, what type of state does this political party want, want to found? And that analysis is immediately complicated by Gramsci's references um, to a type of state and, and also party, which can't be conceived in traditional constitutional terms, uh, with his reference to a notion of a reabsorption of political society within civil society. Obviously, all of these quotations need to be seen in their, in their context of the argumentation in the prison notebooks. But it seems to me Gramsci, uh, as many Marxists of his generation, if not all, were attempting to rethink um, this notion of the non-state state in some terms, the state that goes to sleep, which is the actual word that, that Engels is used, the Einschlafen is, is the word that's used, which disappears um, in the English translation, um, at least, um, and which Lenin will take and develop. This element, I think, in Gramsci is theorized in terms of reabsorption, and the foundation of that type of state with the capacity to reabsorb or to be reabsorbed within the society it would supposedly organize clearly remains theoretically and practically uh, a problem to, to attempt to think through. Gramsci, at least it would seem to me, is attempting to think um, in, in that particular direction. And thus I would suggest that though he's thinking these concepts in terms of the crisis um, and the emergence of the totalitarian forms that he analyzes in the prison notebooks, I think also maintains what is effectively still the type of utopian political project of thinking uh, a possible end of, of, of the state. If not its extinction, perhaps its exhaustion or its reabsorption. Um, and those elements possibly connect with the way Gramsci very peculiarly conceives of the nature of a political manifesto and the reason why he calls the prince the first political manifesto linked to this conception um, of, of the dramatic enactment of, of these elements as constituting the manifesto. The manifesto is not a declaration for Gramsci, it consists almost um, in the capacity to um, move bodies by means of bodies, if we want to resort to quasi-Spinozian um, terminology. And it's exploring that question of the state in those terms that maybe that utopian dimension of Gramsci could be reopened as a contribution to the discussion of the end of the state form.